In autumn 1999, Paul Bevan found a Roman coin in this field in Standish in Gloucestershire. Then he found another one and another and an obsession was born. And five years, one archaeology course and several trenches later, he'd amassed boxes and boxes of Roman and Iron Age finds, like these brooches, these tesserae, this Iron Age axe, all this building material. There's clearly loads of archaeology here, but what exactly is it? Well, there's only so much that one man, however driven, can find out with a trowel and a metal detector, so Paul has invited this lot in to find out. And how long have we got to do it? Just three days. The field in question is in Standish, near Gloucester. Slap bang in the middle of one of the wealthiest areas of Roman Britain. And with finds ranging from the Iron Age to Roman, it should provide a snapshot of the lives of ordinary Brits at the time of the Roman invasion. Quite a little treasure trove that Paul's found. It's a terrific little hall. We've got Roman building material, Roman pottery, Roman brooches, Roman coins, and some Iron Age stuff as well. Have we got any clues yet as to what it might be? I think the fact you've got Iron Age stuff and Roman stuff suggests it's probably a farmstead going through over that period. And in fact, the geophysics suggests that as well. You've done this already? We actually did it four years ago, but we've resurveyed it with a new instrument. And look, it's a whole complex of responses. Yeah. And again. Phil's looking for the early end of our story in Trench 1, where he's expecting to find an Iron Age roundhouse next to the stone surface that Paul uncovered last year. <laughs> yeah, I think that's Paul's excavation. <laughs> Matt puts in trench two over these two large pits. Finds from these should give us an idea of what people were eating and chucking away here and when. Geophys are on the hunt for a Roman building in the area of the field where Paul found most of his roofing tiles and tesserae pieces from mosaics. Could there be a villa here? into the dig and the unpredictable British summer is causing Phil problems in Trench 1 as he tries to make sense of Iron Age archaeology in wet clay. The problem is identifying individual cut features. Paul's finds bear striking similarities with Froster Court just five miles away. Excavations there have revealed an Iron Age farmstead which evolves over the centuries into a substantial stone-built Roman villa with roofing tiles and ceramic wares just like the ones from our field. The pits in Trench 2 have already thrown us a bit of a curved ball. Oh dear, it's skull. Nobody was expecting human remains here. Not much of a ridge. No. Around the bit. Young lady. A young lady. <laughs> Who is she? And when did she die? Well, the only find to come out of the fill of this so far is Roman pottery. Oh. So it has to be early Roman or Roman at least. Right. No so, earlier than that. So not Iron Age at all. Bridget? Yes. You got something interesting there? Well, it's a very tantalising pot piece here, um, and I'm just itching to get into it, just in case it's whole. And did all this lot come out of the same yeah. trench? We've got amazing bits of pottery here. Look, we've got these lovely rims here. We've got a piece of Samian. We've got some bases. We've got black burnished ware. And we've got some incised decoration. It's just wonderful. Yeah. So what story is this telling us? Well, most of this stuff is coming into the second century AED. So this is the local potting industry in a Romanized tradition. It's all part of the gradual Romanization of the settlement and people slowly moving up market. What about structure in this trench? Well, there's certainly evidence again, we've got more roofing tile coming up. Yeah, so there's bit, certainly yeah. something fairly close by. And we've got this daub here that was used for the walls of a Roman building. Mm. If you look where Ian is, there's a lot of pottery coming out of there, so there's no doubt about the date of this. Uh, yeah, we've got things like this, which is a classic Middle Iron Age type of rim, probably talking about 3rd, 2nd century BC. So why have we got a big black blob right in the middle of a roundhouse? Yeah. In fact, it's a ditch of Roman date that would have been cut through here long after the roundhouse itself had disappeared. At the time of the Roman conquest in AD 45, 
Standish was in the pro-Roman Dubunny region of late Iron Age Britain. As our farmstead became enmeshed in the Roman military structure, our Romano Brits, as they became known, could have accumulated sufficient wealth to aspire to leave their Iron Age roundhouses behind them and upgrade to a posh new house built with the roofing tiles, daub and tesserae that Paul found. So where is it? In goes Trench 5. That hasn't moved very far either. It's really nice quality. Pretty unabraded pottery Excellent. altogether, saying that there should be more substantial structural features somewhere nearby. The pottery that Bridges found is so sharp-edged in comparison to Paul's finds that our archaeologists have had to reconsider the location of any Roman structure. It now seems that centuries of ploughing have moved the finds up the field, away from their original location near trenches five and three. It looks like we're getting closer to our building in trench two, where Matt's found some rubble that could be from the foundations of a Roman building. And among it, some iron slag. Ah, here we go, beauty. Is that from the bottom of the furnace? Where you burn your ore and all the clag goes to the bottom and kind of sets iron working on site. <laughs> so our Romano Brits were making iron products here, such as the iron axe that Paul found with his metal detector. Mark, what do these Iron Age settlements look like? In this area, we've got very little to go on, any sort of comparative material. The best site still is Froster, just a few miles to the mm. south of here, which, of course, does develop into a villa. You can see we've got this irregular, come rectilinear, ditched enclosure. And then within that, the excavations revealed numerous circular structures. If you compare that with the geophysics that we've got from here at Standish, you can see we've got these very similar types of enclosure and, of course, at least three circular structures, two of which we've now confirmed mm -hmm. by excavation. And the fact that we've got th at least three of these suggests that we may be seeing the beginnings of a small village starting to form in the closing centuries of the Iron Age. As to how it actually looks, I mean, we, we can only speculate, but Victor's been working on a rather fine sketch here that you know, gives a, a nice impression of what we've just been talking about. You can see each of the roundhouses, these smaller plots perhaps being used for vegetable growing, corralling animals, and probably looking at extended family units occupying each of these little plots. So this looks a bit like a snapshot in maybe the middle of the first century AD, because I see here on the edge somebody's experimenting with the more Roman style yes, of building. Yes, there's a radical house. new introduction, yes. Corners, yes. yes. Are you as frustrated as I am by the fact that we still haven't found this villa? Well, yes, I am. I mean, in a way, because it'd be lovely to find a lovely Roman villa with stone walls and mosaics. Underfloor heating, fountains. Oh, yeah, the whole shooting match. It'd be great. But, you know, we know there's about a 1,000 Roman villas in this country of different shapes and sizes, and even if you stick 50 people in them to include the family and slaves and farm workers and that sort of thing, that's only 50,000 people out of a population we know must have been anywhere between three, perhaps as much as six million. So where were the rest of them living? Well, what we now know from modern archaeology is that far more of them were living in ordinary rural farmsteads. And even, you know, the Iron Age roundhouse we're always hearing about. That building remained in use throughout Britain, throughout the Roman period. But there are wooden Roman buildings as well. Exactly. Now, the kind of thing that we could have is a basic timber frame. When you drop a, a timber into the sleeper trench like that, then you build up a frame of timbers all the way along. And in between that, a lattice work of wattle and daub so that's a sort of twig-like structure here, framework, slap plaster on top of it. That is perfectly strong enough to support a heavy tiled roof. You can stick painted wall plaster on it. You can still have mosaics. But, presumably, it's going to be much harder for our archaeologists to find. Exactly, because we can only see what is visible to us. And unless timber has been burnt, it's just not going to be there. If Guy's right, there'll be nothing to see but clay, Phil's favourite. But there's a ray of hope in Trench 5. 
Bridget, I hear you've got a bit of wall. <laughs> yeah. Oh, crikey, yeah. I've Yesterday, I wanted to get some structure and bingo. Look what's here. All this masonry. But it's not a very massive structure, is it? No, it's not at all. It's only about 40 centimetres. I don't think it's enough to be called footings for a masonry wall. But it could be for a timber wall. If you put a, a one-foot square timber in on top of that, yep. you could support a timber frame building then, Absolutely. You? What I think we need to do is actually do some resistance survey. Right. Um, I hear what you say, it's not a solid stone foundation, but we stand a better chance of seeing a building with resistance. Mm -hmm. Until now, John's been using magnetometry, which measures changes in the Earth's magnetism and shows up metals and heat-affected areas. The resistance survey will pass an electric current through the ground. Solid features such as stone impede the current and will show up as high readings against the low readings of clay soils. In the middle of a field. Well, riding it, I suppose, is the, is the obvious answer, but I mean, this, this is my mobile incident room. I've got, got everything I need here. I've got, I've got my aerial photograph, I've got mobility, and I've got the landscape around me. It's a great way to, to do landscape archaeology. That's all you need. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's the field where we're finding all the remains in there. We're standing here. And down here is a very, very major stream going all the way down. Yeah. Now, if we know from other sites, if there's a villa, and they say if, it's a bigger, mm -hmm. it ought to be somewhere along this stream course. We, we know the site at Froster, to the south. It's a very similar site to here, and that has a villa with it. And where is it? It's next to the only major stream source. Stuart goes in search of a villa elsewhere. But the archaeologists are still convinced that the finds suggest a substantial Roman building within our field. So Mick and Jane decide to take another look at the pottery. This is of particular interest. It looks a bit sad. It was a piece of Samian. Really? It so it looked, looked like that it originally? It would have looked like that originally. Good Lord, so really worn. And it's particularly prestigious, this item, because it's a lion's head from a mortarium with a hole in his mouth area for pouring, a spout. And we can just see the grits on the inside area. Mm -hmm. This would have created a surface for grinding. Mm. And it would have dated to the late second, early third century. And one decent handle. And one decent handle, and <laughs> you would like this, Tony, because that would have been a tankard. How big? Well, I'm told they can go up to three pints. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is Very... more fills than yeah. I know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's a fascinating twist to our Iron Age story emerging from Trench 4, where Ian found the stack of pots. You got bones coming up there? Oh, just a few. It's a horse. Or Good part Lord. of a horse. I mean, this is really getting to be very exciting. Why do you say that's exciting? Well, in, in the Middle and Late Iron Age, across much of southern Britain, you do get these things that people call structured or special deposits. And Ian's exposed here three or four pots that are superimposed and crushed. We've got another pot here. All this burnt stone. So are you saying that these and the horse are deliberately put in here? It in is a, a deliberate deposit. Quite often these deposits are thought to be associated with special events, like perhaps the abandonment of this house and its demolition. It could be like a closure event. And perhaps this involves a feast, and then everything that was associated with that feast, it's all gathered up and placed into this. What's the significance of the horse? Uh, the horse is an animal that takes on growing status in the Iron Age. If you can be seen to afford to kill and consume a horse, it confirms your rank. I mean, it might have been the old nagging, honestly, but it's still a horse. As we search for some clarity to the Roman end of our story, every find helps. Jane, we were just looking at this big old rim, wondering whether it might be amphora or storage jar. Well, Phil, I think what you've got here is a very large storage jar. Quite a squat dumpy pot, but quite a hefty thing for storage. So it's, it's, it's about, what, this high? I would guess so, yes. And we're looking at the later part of the Roman period, maybe 4th century. The date of the storage pot confirms that people were living here late into the Roman period. Mark, are we actually inside the roundhouse here? Yes, we are, yeah, and just sort of cleaning up around these packed stones here. Is this natural? No, you see a lot of these are actually sort of fire reddened, so it could be the base of a hearth or an oven. God, stiff old stuff, isn't it? Yeah. 
So this would have been the hearth that our family sat round, talking about the arrival of the Romans or the state of the farm. So how different was life on the Roman farm in the 3rd and 4th centuries from the life led by the Romano-Brits in the 1st century AD? And the way that the Iron Age farmers who enjoyed their horse barbecue lived their lives in the last centuries BC? I think it's absolutely amazing. Tell me I through mean, it, then. What we're actually standing in is the yard of a, of a Roman farm. And the sort of activities that were going on in that yard include metalworking, Look, we've got this lovely little fire-reddened uh, furnace base. And the nice thing about it is that we've actually got some, some metalworking slag. All oh, right, this is the yard, but where's the farm? The farm starts here. This wall here is actually the boundary of the farmyard. And I think what's happening is that they're actually throwing all their refuse on the other side, because on that side of the wall, we had masses and masses of pottery. On this side, absolutely nothing. There is the base of that foundation. So we've got a large building here facing out onto the yard and a much smaller building also facing out onto the yard. Finally, we're able to piece together an impression of our Roman farm. The outbuildings could have housed the blacksmith who used the furnace. The farmhouse would have been a timber construction. Our Romano Brits had made it, but not quite enough to be able to afford the grand villa, although they still had painted plaster, a mosaic floor, and the latest sandstone roofing tiles. Time Team is 100% independent and funded by our incredible fans. Joining Patreon gives you access to exclusive interviews, 3D models, masterclasses, and more. Please join us on this exciting journey. We need more support, to make more episodes. Take a look at this. And this. And this. It may seem hard to believe, but the locals here in rural Lincolnshire reckon that all these are part of a posh Roman building. And they've got good reason to think so. Because nearby in this field, a local metal detectorist has come up with some really extraordinary finds. Isn't that beautiful? And look at that. And that. They all suggest that in Roman times, something quite special was going on here. And we've got just three days to find out what. The Romans reached Lincolnshire within years of the 43 AD invasion. Lincoln became a great Roman centre, but there are no records of Roman activity at our site, Wickenby, 12 miles from Lincoln. Wickenby seems to be nowhere near any Roman roads, and there's no evidence of a Roman town really close by. And yet metal detectorists have found hundreds of Roman brooches, coins, and bric-a-brac in two fields around Wickenby. Initial geophys has been done by local archaeologists, but what was happening here in Roman times has continued to remain a mystery. Come on then, Francis, this is the 2004 Geophys. What's it tell us? Well, it tells us there's a lot of archaeology there, Danny. There's an awful lot. There are a lot of ditches there. There are on at least two alignments, which suggests at least two phases. There are a lot of finds out of the middle. I think you're looking at a fairly major series of Roman settlements. So Phil opens Trench 1 over an area where a large concentration of finds have been discovered. Righty old out here, let's make a hole. And geophys get going over the rest of the field, where the ditches seem to continue. But it's not long before something Roman does emerge. We've got all the evidence here for a Roman settlement. We've got masses of, of big sherds of Roman pottery. OK, they're a, bit, they're a bit churned around at the edges because they've been in the plough soil, but we've got our first copper alloy object, which was the reason we came here. And we've also got burnt stone, so we can demonstrate that people were actually living here. You're happy that all that is Roman? Oh, yeah. Oh, I think so. But I'm very happy about this, Tony. It's white. It's very heavy. I think it's lead alloy. But what really excites me about this is that I think this could have been actually melted here on site. Look at this. A dozen manky bits in a seed tray, and they think they've got the Roman equivalent of Manchester. <laughs> <laughs> There's archaeologists for you. Jesus. 
Molten lead suggests not rural farming, but metalworking. And John thinks that a huge blob on the geophys may give us more evidence. This blob is actually set within this small ring. And when you look at the characteristics, it's stronger than lots of the other anomalies. And it suggests to me that it might be small-scale industrial, say, a small kiln or oven, something like that. If it is industry, Guy, what do you think it might be? Oh, I agree with John. There's a range of possibilities. and A kiln, pottery industry, that's perfectly possible. But actually, we've got so many metal finds from the site and scrap-type metal finds that I think one of the most likely possibilities is that it's a furnace to do with um, bronze metalwork. And where would the metal have come from? There's going to be new metal being mined, but also there's a whole industry of scrap metal going on in the Roman world. You know, the time we live in, metal's terribly cheap and labour is terribly expensive. But in the ancient world, as in the third world today, it's much cheaper to get a man to rework old metal. So you've probably got scrap metal coming in as well as the stuff that's being made here. So do you think that some of those metal detectoring finds, which look so fantastic to us, could actually have been old metal that's being recycled? Oh, some of them almost certainly are because they're so broken and damaged and it would explain why they're in that state and why they've been left here. Ah, got archaeology here. But at least Phil's beginning to expose hard evidence of activity on the site. Tracy? Yeah? This is a lot more promising. We think we've got, probably got some sort of a ditch, but when we come back here... Now, look. Oh, yeah. Charcoal. Nice. Now, that is the most encouraging archaeological material I've seen in any of the trenches. With signs of burning, things are looking good for Guy's proposed recycling centre, where tools, sculptures and bowls could have been made. Well, you promised me a big trench. This isn't bad, is it? <laughs> well, you can see now, Tony, why we need such a big trench. It's absolutely crammed with archaeology. I mean, up here, there seems to be a, a floor or a spread of some sort. I mean, it's, it's loads of pottery. You can see Roman pottery at the surface there. And then as you come round here, if you look along there, you can see there's a diagonal one. Just going right through to our feet here, yeah. To our feet here, and continuing. At the far end, that produced Iron Age pottery, so that could be early. Then you come round here, and there... They've got two things there. That's it, yeah. And, and uh, they've got Roman pottery in them. So, I mean, there's shed loads of archaeology here. Would you say that this is categorical evidence that we've got Roman settlement here? Oh, without a shadow of doubt. Oh, yes. But is the Iron Age here and anything later? That's what I want to find out. So not only have we got a substantial Roman settlement, but Francis suspects this ditch is part of an earlier Iron Age one. While we close down Trench 1, John's Geophys has uncovered a whole new feature. And we've heard there's a water spring in the corner of the field. The Romans recycled many forms of metal, including coins. And indeed, coins keep emerging at Wickenby. Look at that. Oh, wow. Silver denarius, sort of late first, early second century. Look at the mm. detail on the head. Absolutely crisp as a button. It's beautiful. My brain's turned to mush this afternoon. We've got <laughs> geophys that looks like spaghetti. We've got archaeology, which is just loads of big shadows in the ground. We don't really know where we are, do we? Well, in a way, the, the problem is we've got too much archaeology. I mean, on the ground, it, it looks very simple, but once you take off the topsoil, we've got ditches everywhere, we've got pits, we've got post holes, we've got a mass of stuff. We've got finds virtually coming out of our ears, and I reckon in the last hour or so, we, we, we think we've probably got a, a wall, a sort of structure. You've got three bricks, Phil. <laughs> it's looking like a wall! <laughs> All right. Look, what you need to do is stand back and look at the geophysics. We've just talked about this boundary to the settlement that goes with the Iron Age. A whole series of roundhouses are now visible across the field. These go with the curving ditches. Then you've got these straight lines, which I think is the Roman settlement superimposed on top. It's a clear picture in the geophysics, I think. Yesterday in the pub, Francis and John also decided to open a trench which could give clues to Roman industry on this rural site, as they think it's a kiln. So yet another trench gets underway. 
basically, we're just starting to hit that edge. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, keep you going in. A little in. bit more. Yeah. Only a little bit. Over the three days, Bridge has been busy conserving one of the most spectacular Roman finds from the site, a metal bowl. That is really nice, isn't it? It's, it's wonderful. It's just looking so much nicer than, than... I mean, I couldn't imagine that this is what was underneath, all that horrible caked-up old soil. Yeah, it's so it? shiny and so lovely. Although some of it is corrosion, I believe that this one here is a deliberate perforation and cut on the side of the object. Also, this one here. Now, they would be two good places where you'd be able to actually suspend the bowl or the pan, so you could have had chains attached to the bowl and then pulling up and attaching to that scale that um, Helen's demonstrated. It was at least harder than the brass it was made from, so you're chucking in things like bronze or stone or iron. The evidence that Bridge has revealed suggests a story of work, not of rural farming, but of recycling and industry. And the same story is emerging in what Francis had hoped to be a Bronze Age burial. It's not round at all. <laughs> no, it's round, Tony, and it's a ditch. It may be a house, but I think far more likely it's something rather different, because out of that ditch we're finding this stuff. This is... Uh, plaster? plaster? Yeah. And it's uh, Roman, it can't be Iron Age. But what makes it exciting is that some of it is actually painted. You can see here it's painted in two different colours. It's lovely, isn't it? It is. Now, that sort of plaster only comes out of high-status buildings. So could there be a Roman building right here? So this could be some form of a workshop, I think. So no prehistoric structure for Francis, but we have got a Roman workshop. Metal recycling and now stone recyclers. One, two... But in coring, we discover the feature, possibly a well, is very, very deep. It's, it's not that still going, still yeah. going. <laughs> it's, a, it's a well. It's definitely a well. <laughs> the excavation becomes so waterlogged, we just can't resolve this trench's story. But Stuart's found answers from the Roman landscape. We've got this whole complex of Roman boundaries and ditches and stuff in our field, but is there any evidence of that Roman life still in the landscape today? One thing that is really quite striking here is the way these old things come together towards this place called Rand, where there is evidence of a Roman settlement. Now, that looks to be like a small market centre where whatever was being produced here at our site will be transported down to Rand and then exchange, sold, whatever, and then along the Roman road network to Lincoln and, and beyond. Our site's a glimpse of Roman Britain archaeologists have been missing before, one of a large rural population of widespread industry and recycling, stimulated by a new commercial culture. Yesterday evening, the only tangible archaeology we'd got was stains in the ground, except in the pub, to much hilarity, it has to be said, Phil alleged that he'd got a wall, and the evidence for his wall was three manky stones. <laughs> Have you still got a wall? Totally vindicated, Tony, absolutely. Those three manky stones that you described them as, look, this is what they are. Look, there they are, going through there. And the edge of the trench, as we saw it, came across there. Now, we've subsequently pushed that back, and look, we've got one stone there, we've got another stone there, but we've also got an inside edge to the wall as well, which is coming around there. And you can see the whole thing is curving back round. Now, I think that this is probably going to be a, a furnace or a kiln. Hang on, hang on. The furnaces you've shown me in the past don't have that light clay stuff there. They're always black. That's after they've been used. This one was never used. It was either constructed and, and it fell down because there was a flaw in the design or, or failing that, they didn't need it. It, it. Maybe it just collapsed, maybe it was just unstable. But the thing is, this has never been fired. This is what they would have looked like when they were built. We came to Wickenby to investigate a Roman site. In doing so, we've uncovered a very early prehistoric site that grew into a vast and important Iron Age settlement. 
When the Roman economy arrived, the rural settlement here embraced it. People here were trading with coins, building kilns, working metal and even stone. This community constantly changed and recycled, adapting to a new Roman world. Time Team is 100% independent and funded by our incredible fans. Want us to make more episodes? Joining Patreon gives you access to exclusive interviews, 3D models, masterclasses, and more. And you get to have your say in the process as we develop new sites. Back in the days of Queen Victoria, an amateur archaeologist made an intriguing discovery underneath these Somerset fields. Two Roman mosaics. Have a look at this drawing. See the detail? in that rose pattern there. Classic evidence of a Roman villa. But that's not all. Experts think there could be even better mosaics still down there. Although there's a very good reason why they haven't tried to look. For the last hundred years, this whole area has been an army firing range. What we've done is we've re-surveyed a small area and, I mean, the results are just so clearly. It just has to be villa building. All the wall lines, corridors, rooms, a whole mass of responses. How deep down do you reckon this stuff is? I think it's pretty shallow, probably not more than, you know, half a metre. The geophys hints at dozens of rooms, any of which could hold the mosaics. But one spot in the corner looks particularly promising. So, in goes Trench One. <laughs> and, oh, look, someone's happy. And almost immediately, Phil and Neil find something rather special. Oh, no, then. What's the guy? Oh, well, even you know what that is, yeah, Phil. I do. That's part of a mosaic floor. That was quick. Tiny bits of stone like these are called tesserae. The building blocks of a mosaic. Let's hope that's a good omen of things to come. Oh! Oh! <laughs> well, it's not bad, is it, for the first... <laughs> the first bit of the first trench? We've got a tessery and we've got a coin. Do you know, there's only 12 coins recorded from this site so far from the antiquarian, so lucky 13. <laughs> <laughs> so our second trench goes in just a few metres away from our first to see if we've got a high-status room in the middle of the villa with one of the mosaics in it. And bang on target, guess what we find? Woohoo! Tracy, there are excited whispers from the other trench that you've found a little bit of mosaic. We have, Tony, yeah. I mean, you can see we've got a little bit in here and then a bit beyond where Ratchard's working. A little bit of a mosaic. Come on, Tony, it's carrying on underneath here, so I think we're going to have to extend the trench back this way. There's a gap in the middle there. Do you think you've accidentally hit it? No, we didn't hit it. Um, it's most probably plough damage. If you actually look at the section, we're not that far from the top mm. at all. So John's looking pretty pleased with his geophysics. Although it's still very muddy, this must be one of the mosaics we've been asked to look for. This is a smaller room here with this mosaic in. The division between the rooms should be about here in this train. And like buses, you wait for ages in the cold for one mosaic... Whoa! ..and two come along at once. Imagine all the hundreds of posh sandal feet that must have walked over that. Yeah, and not just the posh guys, because you know, there's a whole army of slaves and servants that were needed to keep a house of this style and status running. I mean, there are some Latin authors that talk about a group of, called the Burgundi, which are a band of, sort of runaway slaves and brigands, roaming around Britain and Gaul, ransacking and just nicking things. So, actually, in, in rubble and burning, we're seeing the last days of Rome in Britain. Absolutely. It's really about the end of the Roman way of life, which is funded by the Roman economy. As the day draws to an end, the sun and the colour in the mosaics are starting to shine through. Sadly, they've deteriorated since they were last seen 150 years ago, probably from ploughing. But at least we've ensured that they'll be protected in future. 
Is this one room or two rooms or what? Yes, it's both. <laughs> <laughs> it's what's called a bipartite room. Two rooms that operate as one. You've got like your entrance hall almost with this lovely mosaic that's really sort of vibrant with its colours now that it's been sponged down. Then you can see here that we've got this semicircular footing. Yeah. What we might have here is like a half column actually attached to the wall, rising up with a nice big decorative capital, in which case we're looking at a grand double doorway through the steps into here, or it's the pedestal base for a statue. Either way, we're looking at a very, very grand room. What would the walls have been like? Almost certainly richly decorated, painted wall plaster. But of course we haven't found much here because this has already been cleared out by Moncton in the 1860s. And that's not all. Curiously, we appear to have post holes driven into the mosaic floor. This act of vandalism is perhaps more evidence that life here struggled on after the end of Roman Britain. Over the past three days, we've unearthed a villa which mirrors the rise and fall of Roman Britain. A modest house which ended up with pretensions of grandeur. In its heyday, cheap blue and white lias mosaic corridors would have led into a large summer dining room. With our two mosaic floors, and on a fine day, views across the valley beyond. On the dining room table, perhaps the fake silver spoons we found. All in all, dare we say it, just a little bit chav. Home to a minor aristocrat, his or her family, and of course keeping the whole thing going in the background, servants and slaves. But the good times weren't to last. It struggled on into the 5th century, but the villa, along with Roman Britain, was past its sell-by date. Hello, my name's John Gator. Time Team is fan-funded by Patreon. This vital support helps us to make new episodes. Joining Patreon gives you access to exclusive interviews 3D models and masterclasses, plus lots more.